Hi. How's it going? Good, man. Good How to are see you? you. Yeah, you too. This is David Shaw. David is the owner of the Northern Joinery. He's a professional woodworker. I made a video about him a few months ago, and while I was there, David offered for me to come by and root through his scrap bin. And now, four months later, I'm finally gonna look through it, see if we can find some cool stuff. There's not as much as there usually is because we've had a couple of people pick through just about anything in this bin. Wow. Um, can, you can take some white oak, some walnut, uh, you know, really cool piece of bird's eye maple. That's amazing. This is crazy. There is so much beautiful wood here. I almost feel guilty taking it. You wanna, you wanna go out back? Sure, yeah. So pretty well any of this sh here. Oh my God, it just never ends. <laughs> are these cutoffs or are these gonna be going um, to a piece? Some of these, like chances are some of the larger cookies I'll wind up using at some point in time. But there's a, like, there's a lot of in here, man. And I just, in reality, can't ever get through it. These are pretty cool too. These big spalted cookies under here. Yeah. Right, like those are pretty awesome. Wow. Um, you could take a few of those if you wanted. Oh my gosh. <laughs> um, giant walnut cookies. Just shit that I have that I don't know that I'll ever really get around to doing anything with because we're so busy and most of the stuff that comes in these days is very specific. I'm curious about the overall shape of this guy. Yeah, it's... Like that U is really cool. Yeah, it is really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. If I can take this, yeah, I would... for sure. ...make something really cool using for that. For sure, man. All right, let's do it. Awesome, thank you. You got it? Beautiful. I know. That is like gorgeous. <laughs> you know what it reminds me of? What? Like the like the pillow that pregnant women sleep with. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself. This spalted maple cookie really is gorgeous. And while David gave us so much beautiful <laughs> And while David gave us so much beautiful wood, some white oak and walnut and bird's eye maple, I just can't take my eyes off this thing. And I think I know just what to do with it. So when I look at this cookie, I see a crescent. And I wanna make a base that follows that crescent shape. And to make the base, I think I have the perfect piece. Yes. Of 18 millimeter Baltic birch plywood. I wanna kerf bend these pieces to form the base. Kerf bending is when you cut a series of slits in a piece of wood and then you can bend it into a radius. I used an online calculator to figure out the spacing of my kerf cuts. As you can see, I already marked out all my lines. This is a kerf every two inches. And we have 27 kerf cuts per board. And since both of these are exactly the same, I'm gonna try to cut both of them at once. is bendy. I made some simple bending jigs out of scrap plywood and I think we're ready to bend the first piece. I wanna start by wetting down the back surface to hopefully make that thin veneer more pliable and avoid any splintering. Flip that back over and start filling the slits with wood glue. All right, I've never done this before. I've never kerf bent something this big, only a very small kerf bending, so kind of flying blind. This is gonna go around the outside. No splintering sounds yet, which is a good sign. Okay. 
Wow, I actually think this might work. This is the least stressful bending I've ever experienced. I guess you get better when you practice. Go figure, right? Boom, ha <laughs> ha, we did it, I think. Just hope that when it dries, this thing doesn't spring back into a flat piece. <laughs> All right, now we just wait. Early the next morning. The glue's been curing for a full 24 hours, so it should be set up enough that this should hold its shape. All right, looks good so far. Now if we flip it, yeah, that is holding the shape. Woo! Now we just gotta do it again. There we go, two identical curves. Now both of these are the right radius, but unfortunately they're the wrong length. One of these needs to be a little longer and the other one needs to be a little shorter. I modeled this whole thing in Fusion, so in principle, I know exactly how much to take off of one and attach to the other. But in practice, I think this is gonna be pretty tricky. But at this point, we gotta just do it. To get the shape I want, I figured out that I have to cut along this curve here. And as much as I'd like to use my track saw for that, because I'm cutting in a curve, the cut wouldn't be perpendicular to the surface. This would also be an extremely dangerous cut. I would have to put a ton of blocks here to support this from either side. So as janky as it might sound, I think that the best way to make this cut is with a reciprocating saw. Now to give myself the cleanest results possible, I'm gonna apply masking tape on each side of the cut to reduce chip out. I'm hoping that the existing cut guides the saw blade, and since we're only cutting through a bit of wood glue and veneer, I think this might actually work pretty well. All right, we've prepped as much as we can. Let's do it. Oof. <laughs> oh no. That is a really ugly cut. Man, look at that. That is not even close to straight. Dang it. I really thought that would work better. All right, I think we can fix this. I have a simple jointing jig on my table saw. I don't have a jointer, but these are super easy to make with a piece of scrap plywood. I'll link the tutorial in the description. And I think if we just do a couple passes on that raggedy edge, we should get it nice and straight. That worked perfectly. We got nice, beautiful, straight edge there. You can't even tell which one we cut. <sighs> oh man. I thought we were out of the woods, but I just realized something else. This is the little piece we cut. This is the full curve, and I want to attach these two together like this. But since we cut right along one of these curves, if we put these together, this area is flat. We should have cut between two of the curves so that we maintain the curve all the way around. But once again, I think we can fix it. If I set the blade of my table saw to the exact same angle of each of the curve bends, I should be able to use the jointing jig to put that exact same angle on the end of the short piece. So then when I'm gluing together, the curve will look nice and continuous. So you can barely see it, but now there's a six degree bevel on the end of this piece. And if we put them together, we have a nice continuous curve with no noticeable flat spot. And then I made some simple brackets to ensure the correct angle and help join these together nice and strong. Beautiful. While the glue is drying on this, I wanna switch gears and work on the tabletop. First things first, I wanna deal with the edges of this cookie. Some of the areas are chipped. There's some bark still hanging on. So we're gonna clean it up with some power carving. I also have this cushion for my random orbit sander that should allow us to get around the contours of the edges and clean them up really nicely.
Part of what makes this piece of maple so beautiful is the spalting. Those are the black lines running all throughout the piece like tendrils. But spalting is actually a form of decay. It means that fungus has worked its way into the wood, and the last thing we want is this thing cracking in half because it's been weakened by essentially rot. So we are going to seal the wood with Total Boat Penetrating Epoxy. This is a super low viscosity epoxy resin that will soak into the wood and strengthen it. Thank you to Total Boat for sponsoring this video. Check out the link in the description for a discount. Oh my God, I almost forgot. <laughs> Now, if, if I were to use this, do you think it should be like re-kiln dried or just air dried uh, it's only It's only been outside for about a week okay, and it's right. all been kiln dried. Do you have a moisture meter? I do, yeah. So, I mean, check it, that's key. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's a, anything above 10 or 11%, don't use it. Okay. Because it will move way too much. All right, so we are in hardwood mode. 2.4%, let's go. 1.1% over there, 1.5. Yeah, the highest is right there, 3.7, four, ish percent. That was a close one. <laughs> let's pour some epoxy. While the epoxy cures on the cookie, I wanna sand off the lines caused by the curve bending and get these into nice uniform curves. That sanding cushion I have is gonna be super handy for sanding inside this curve here. Let's do it. link these two pieces together, I made these super simple end pieces out of solid hard maple. I can screw them into both ends, sand them into a nice invisible transition, and we will have our full crescent. Boom! Got ourselves a crescent. Well, I think I have my work cut out for me. <laughs> From the very beginning, I knew that I wanted the base to be a gloss black. The cookie is very natural, both in color and shape, and I think this hyper-modern base will make a super cool contrast. But I had no idea what to finish this thing with. So I reached out to Total Boat and they recommended their wet edge marine paint. This stuff is actually made for painting boats. So it's kind of overkill for this table base, but I think it will give us the look and durability that I'm looking for. I sanded this up to 150 grit and cleaned off all the dust with this special brushing thinner 100. Before we apply the wet edge, I'm going to apply this marine primer. This will give us a very uniform surface and hide all the ugly stripes and wood filler that we have all over this thing and reveal what I hope is a nice uniform curve. Let's see. The gray primer makes it really easy to see the little cracks that we missed filling in, but we can easily fill those in with some spackling and sand it off before our next coat of primer. Woo-wee! 
This thing actually feels like the hull of a boat. It is super smooth and glossy. I ended up doing two coats of primer and three coats of paint, and that process took about five days because each coat of paint needed 16 hours to cure. So at this point, ah, our epoxy is definitely fully cured. And now I can use the router sled to take down these raised areas of epoxy and turn this into a nice flat table. Let's do it. Oh my God, that took so many passes. And of course, it's like the hottest day of the year. We got this thing flat, but it is not the nicest finish. There is a lot of chip out and all of the rotted out areas. I think especially because this is end grain. Yeah, in some areas the chip out is so bad, it's like gouged out. Fortunately, I was planning on this side to be the bottom. So let's see what the other side looks like in comparison. Oh yeah, this side is way better. There are still some chipped out areas in the edges. Like these edges here are really severely rotted out with a lot of bug holes. I mean, it looks really cool with the spalting, but the trade-off with that is you don't get the smoothest finish. All right, I think we're gonna keep this side the top because this definitely turned out way better. And hopefully with some sanding, we can get these areas nice and smooth. So I got this sanded up to 120 grit. It's feeling really smooth, but those chipped out areas are still really noticeable. And I'm seeing now that no amount of sanding is gonna get rid of those. Like I can't have that on the finished surface. It just doesn't feel good. It feels low quality. Now I could flood coat the entire thing in epoxy. That will create an eighth inch consistent surface on top of all of the wood but I, I really don't wanna do that. It's gonna add so much more time to this project. I really wanna use an oil finish and preserve the feeling of the wood. I think there's one thing we can try. It might not work, but it's worth a shot. In the past, I've used CA glue to fill little bug holes and divots in the wood. And technically we could use this to fill all the little chipped out areas. It will be a lot, but it will dry fast. And if it works, we can sand this and not have to flood coat the entire thing in epoxy. Oh my gosh, that actually worked. With two rounds of CA glue and sanding, we got a nice smooth surface, and I don't think we have to do a flood coat. Let's get it. Before we do the final round of sanding, there's one more detail I wanna add. I don't think this video needs any more footage of me sanding, but I spent another hour sanding this up to 320 grit and it is now glassy smooth, especially since I water popped the grain. I removed all the dust with mineral spirits and we're ready for finish. Let's do it. Ooh, this looks so good. I am so happy that we didn't have to do a flood coat of epoxy. This thing looks absolutely incredible with the Rubio Monocoat. It's got a super smooth satin finish. And now we're ready for the final step, attaching the legs. This big chunk of wood will definitely expand and contract over its lifetime with temperature and humidity changes. And we need to allow for that wood movement when we mount it to the base. So I made some super simple mounting brackets with slots that will give us a really strong connection, but still allow for some movement and avoid any cracking or other generally bad things. <laughs> little threaded insert. 
with a bit of CA glue on the threads for holding strength. There is no way I'm gonna be able to fit my driver in there to tighten it because it's too close to the side, but I have this handy right angle adapter. Boom. All right, moment of truth, does it hold? Yeah, let's get it. I spent about an hour taking some nice photos and posting the table for sale on my Instagram page, YouTube, Facebook, and threads, because apparently now that's a thing. And I listed it for 2,200 Canadian, which is about 1650 US dollars. To me, that just seemed like a good price for this table based on the things I've made in the past and the Toronto furniture market. And I'm trying to sell this table locally in the greater Toronto area for one, Avoiding shipping is always so much nicer. I've had problems with customs in the past. I could ship it within Canada, but that base is gonna require a huge box. The posts are live. Also, how cute is this photo of Penny? I mean, come on. If the table doesn't sell because of that photo alone, I don't know what's wrong with this world. <laughs> now all we can do is wait. In the week since posting the table for sale, I've gotten messages from interested buyers in Mississippi, California, and Hong Kong, but no one local, which I wasn't really expecting to sell it within a week anyway. But to get some more eyeballs on this thing, I also made a short form video that took about 90 minutes. And I don't know why I didn't think of this sooner, but I also posted it in local Facebook groups. Most areas have a bunch of buy, sell, and trade groups. My area has about 10 of them, so I just, posted it to all of them at once. Facebook makes it really easy to do that. So yeah, I'm feeling optimistic. It's been about a week since I dropped the price and I still have had no luck finding a buyer in my local area. But I keep getting messages and comments from people from all over the world who wanna buy this coffee table. So. I think I have to get out of my own way and, and just ship this thing. So let's build a shipping crate. So when I built the shipping crate, I was still looking for a buyer. Once I had it all built and the table all packaged up, I messaged everyone who was interested in buying the table to tell them that shipping was now available. It had been long enough that some of them weren't interested anymore and some of them had just found other tables. But Jaylene in Virginia was still interested. She had a total budget of $2,000 US and the reduced price was 1,900 Canadian, which is about 1,400 US. Shipping this thing to Virginia cost 400 US dollars, but that's only half the battle. I've shipped things internationally before and had issues to the point where a piece was actually returned to me. I tell the full story in this video and I did not want a repeat of that situation. So this time I splurged on a customs broker that cost $300, which pushes us $100 over the $2,000 budget. But I think that extra cost is well worth the peace of mind to ensure this thing arrives safe and sound. I hope. I hope I'm not making a post in a month about some unforeseen disaster. Ah, it'll be fine. I put so much time into figuring out the shipping and customs logistics. A lot of that I'll just put under self-education, but I think two hours on this project is a fair estimate. So that brings the total time spent on this project to 23 hours and 15 minutes. Now, did we actually make any money on this project? Let's find out. Of course, the cookie was free, but I spent $48 on the Baltic birch plywood. We used 2.3 liters of penetrating epoxy, which is about $102. A half quart of the marine primer, about $30. A pint of the wet edge paint, 
$42. That end grain really soaked up Rubio Monaco and I had to use two thirds of a can, which cost $81. Consumables like paper towels, gloves, I'll throw in $15 for that. For the shipping crate, we used two sheets of OBS, that's $44. Probably about two two by fours, that's eight bucks. To protect the piece, I used a four by eight sheet of one inch rigid insulation, that was $20. And then in Canadian dollars, the shipping was $536 and the customs broker was $399. That brings our total cost to 1,325 Canadian dollars or 996 US. Since Jaylene paid us $2,000 US, that gives us an hourly rate of $43 US or $57 Canadian. It feels very fulfilling to have overcome this hurdle of international shipping, or at least I think so. I mean, <laughs> the table hasn't arrived yet, so I hope everything turns out okay, but I'm pretty sure I covered all my bases. Just hope you don't see a post from me in a week about some disaster that happened. <laughs> and I couldn't have done it alone. I wanna give a huge shout out to Designs by Arc on Instagram. They are a Canadian based woodworker who is very experienced with shipping to the States and gave me so much great advice. If you'd like to see what I'm up to behind the scenes, you can gain exclusive access to the behind the scenes Instagram page and my Discord community by supporting this channel on Patreon. I wanna give a special shout out to my top supporter, my mom, Kathy Kurt. Thanks mom, I love you.